We've already worked extensively with entropy and the partition function, but now I want to continue our exploration by looking at what happens near zero Kelvin. And so I'll recall for you that the entropy can be expressed as Boltzmann's constant times the log of the partition function plus kt times the partial derivative of the log of the partition function with respect to temperature, holding number of particles and volume constant. And now let's actually expand Q and remember what the partition function is. It's the sum over all states exponential minus the energy of that state divided by Boltzmann's constant times temperature. So I've swapped that in for Q here in the first term and I've swapped it in for the partial log of Q. I've actually carried out the differentiation and so I get a 1 over T term and I get this expression when I take the derivative. We've taken this derivative multiple times uh, because T appears here. I'll pull down the E sub J over K. That'll cancel K over K. I'm left with this E sub J term and I end up also with the partition function again. So I'll let you revisit that derivative if you'd like to, but it's one we've taken before in the past. What I want to do here is explore the question of how does this expression behave as the temperature goes to zero? which is to say, is the statistical thermodynamic definition of entropy consistent with the third law of thermodynamics? Well, so let's look at the partition function as temperature goes to zero, the low temperature partition function. And to make things a little more convenient, let me work with levels instead of states. And so remember what that means is I'm now going to switch my index over which my sum is running. I'm going to run over energy levels, so all levels that have the same energy. The degeneracy, which expresses how many levels have the same energy, g, e to the minus energy of that level over kt. And let me, in fact, then pull out from this expression e to the minus the ground state energy, e0, over kt. So I'll take that out as a constant. It's just some number. It's multiplying this sum. And so it's the degeneracy of a given state, e to the minus the difference between that state and the ground state energy. Right? And so here I have e to the minus e0 over kt. Here I have e to the minus a minus is plus e0 over kt. So I've sort of multiplied by 1 and turned my 1 into something inside and outside the summation. But the utility of that is, as the temperature goes to 0, the argument of this exponential is divided by something going to zero. So it's becoming e to the minus a very, very large number since I'm divided, dividing by something going to zero. So it's going to zero itself. So for every level other than n, all those terms go to zero. And I will be left with, in that case, simply the limit as t goes to zero of the partition function is the degeneracy of the ground state times e to the minus e0 over kt. So given that that's the low temperature behavior of the partition function, let me then uh, return to my general expression here, apply that same sort of analysis to all these sums over exponentials, and I'll end up with then this sum is replaced by g0 e to the minus e0. This sum is also replaced by that. Of course, it was being multiplied times the state energy, so the only state that survives is the ground state, so that E0 sticks around. And this is, again, just Q re-expressed. And so now if I look at these in general, I have a log of a product, so I will get K log degeneracy, K log of an exponential, so that just becomes the argument of the exponential. So I'll get e0, negative e0 over kt. I'm multiplying times Boltzmann's constant. So that's just minus e0 over t. And now if I go and look at what survived over here, g0, g0, that cancels. e to the minus e0 over kt in numerator and denominator, that cancels. The only thing left is e0 over t. So these two terms are equal and opposite to one another. Finally, all that is left is k log degeneracy of the ground state. Right? And therefore, as the temperature goes to zero, the entropy determined from the partition function also goes to zero. 
to within the ground state degeneracy. So let's really do this. Let's use all these tools to do a first principles computation of entropy, a third law entropy. All right, and we're going to do it for, uh, well, I'll say what we'll do it for in a moment. First, let's just recapitulate the relevant equations. Here is the entropy expressed in terms of the partition function. And let's use an ideal gas partition function, which allows us to express the total partition function as a molecular partition function to the nth power over n factorial. And in particular, let's do a diatomic ideal gas. And so you can go look this equation up again if you'd like to in video 4.6 but it has a translational component to the partition function, a rotational, a vibrational, and an electronic. And what we need to do, and this is a wonderful math exercise, is take this Q, this little Q, plug it in here to the nth power over n factorial in order to get capital Q, take its partial derivative with respect to T, and then also just multiply the log of it by Boltzmann's constant. And so I have here great math exercise. I'm not actually going to do it term by term here. It's a lovely thing to sit down at a table with and try to verify what I'm about to show you, but it's just straightforward differentiation. Here's the final expression. just barely fits on the slide. So I'm going to use n is equal to Avogadro's number so that I have the molar entropy. And I'm going to uh, divide by r because all these terms multiply r. So just for simplicity's sake, I'll put the r over here on the left-hand side. And so I get this term log of uh, things that look like they might be associated with the translational partition function, something that involves the rotational temperature, the vibrational temperature, another term in vibrational temperature, the ground state degeneracy of the electronic state. And you also see lurking in here some e's. So that's really the number e. And if you think about that, if I take the log of e to the 5 halves, that just gives 5 halves. And this is in units of r. So somewhere in here is a 5 halves r contribution. And you might remember that entropy has, say, a half an r from translation in all directions. And you get an r out of Stirling's approximation. So as I say, I'll let you verify this expression as a good side exercise if you'd like. Um, but really what I'd like to do in terms of a, a little self-assessment here is looking at this expression, try to do a little bit of a sanity check of when might you expect entropy to be large relative to of one molecule relative to another, who would have more or less entropy. So let me give you a moment to think about that, and then we'll come back. All right, hopefully the sanity check all made sense. And now let's take a closer look at this expression for the molar entropy of a diatomic ideal gas. So this first term contains uh, all of the contribution from translation. And it also, by convention, if you had actually worked out the full computation of entropy, you'd have had a Stirling's approximation term that came from log of n factorial. And by convention, that gets lumped into the translational piece here as well. There's a term deriving from the rotations of the diatomic molecule, two terms that derive from the vibration. There's only one vibration in a diatomic. And then finally, there's an electronic term. And so what do we need in order to actually compute the entropy? Well, this is nitrogen, nitrogen gas. And so appearing in this first expression are the masses of the two atoms in the diatomic. And if we were doing two nitrogen-14 isotopes, they'd, M1 would be equal to M2. So it's about 28 atomic mass units. A tiny bit different because the atomic mass unit is defined for carbon-12, but close enough. You could go look up the exact number in kilograms if you want to. The symmetry number appears in the rotational term, and it's 2 for a homonuclear diatomic. And we need the rotational temperature. And if you go look that up, I, we had it on previous slides as well. It's 2.88 Kelvin. In the next two terms, the only thing we need to know is the vibrational temperature. And again, that's something we've had on prior uh, videos as well as you can find it in tables. 3,374 Kelvin. And lastly, you need to know the ground electronic state uh, degeneracy. And it's one for nitrogen. It is not a degenerate state. It's just non-degenerate. So if I take all these values and plug them in, and everything else up here is a constant, Boltzmann's constant, pi, Planck's constant, Avogadro's number, 
by convention, we choose a molar volume at which we're tabulating things, and that's the volume of an ideal gas, say, at uh, room temperature. So plug all those numbers in, and you will find that I'll, I'll just give the numbers by piece, 150.4 joules per Kelvin per mole deriving from this first term, translation, 41.13 from rotation, 1.15 times 10 to the minus third, so that's really quite small compared to these other two terms, from vibration, none at all from the electronic degeneracy, because really there's no disorder associated with the, uh, with the electronic state. It's in exactly one state, the ground state, and so there's no entropy because there's no disorder. Similarly, this vibrational temperature is so high, 3,374 Kelvin, that effectively all the vibrations are in the ground state. So again, not much disorder there, and it only contributes a thousandth of a joule per Kelvin per mole. But add them all together, and you get that the standard entropy is 191.5 joules per Kelvin per mole, and I should put a bar over this. This really is the molar uh, entropy. And I'll just remind you that if you go back to video 7.3, where I showed an example of using or at least tabulated experimental data that would have come from heat capacity measurements, the value that was determined there was 191.6 joules per Kelvin per mole. So to within 0.1 joule per Kelvin per mole, that is quantitative agreement. So I think this is an amazing result to some extent. It is an incredibly powerful example of just how much insight we gain into the behavior of a macroscopic gas because we understand its molecular properties. By plugging those molecular properties into an expression that depended on them, we were able to compute the entropy effectively exactly. And the important, maybe even beyond that, we know where that entropy comes from. We know that uh, more than mm, almost three quarters, I'd say, comes from the translation, and most of the rest comes from the rotation. And that, I think, is a fascinating molecular level of insight that comes from statistical molecular thermodynamics. All right, well, uh, that was a single example. I'd like to now expand and uh, do some additional considerations of third law entropies in general. So we'll get to that next.